We study billionaires, and this is episode 42 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, everybody. How you doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. So uh, Stig really wanted to have a fun episode today. So he decided to read every single shareholder letter that Warren Buffett has written. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But you know what? The, a lot of people might hear that and think that they're going to be bored to death as we talk about shareholder letters that were published since 1965. But what we're going to do is we're really going to try to make this fun for you. So we're going to be talking about some uh, very interesting concepts. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to extract the really key uh, points out of these shareholder letters so that you kind of can have this ability to know kind of what everyone else doesn't know about Berkshire Hathaway and how the, the company operates and why it's different than any other company out there. So that's what we're going to really try to focus on are those key points. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the four different types of businesses that Berkshire Hathaway has so you can kind of understand the composition. So before we get into that, I just want to briefly describe um, kind of the history with Berkshire Hathaway in, in the event that you don't know anything about it. So Warren Buffett actually started off with a partnership where people could invest money with him and then he would take that money, he would invest it. And if he had a, if he had a great year, uh, he would actually get paid. And if it was a bad year, or he wasn't making money. He actually didn't take any money at all. Later, as he kind of honed his investing skills, he kind of he kind of realized that he was handicapped by the people that were giving him the money to invest. Uh, now, he had his partnership kind of structured in a manner that mitigated that a lot, but he still had the people that when the market was booming, were giving him more cash and, and he was trying to invest this money as everything was overvalued. Uh, and then when the market would crash, he still had people pulling money away from him whenever he needed it most because that's whenever he could buy undervalued companies. So what he had, he decided to do is he decided to adjust his approach where he wanted to own a public company. And by owning a public company, he could actually take advantage of that behavior. So when the market was really high, he could actually sell more shares to people if he wanted to raise capital. And then when the market would crash, if people were trying to take their money away or, or sell his company short, he could actually buy those shares back uh, under the under the company veil and he would actually do very well for himself. So he basically took that structure and he flipped it on its head. Now, his biggest mistake, he says, was actually buying Berkshire Hathaway. And I think a lot of people might hear that quote and say, that makes no sense. I don't understand that. But here's the history of why he has made that quote. Uh, whenever he bought Berkshire Hathaway, he had this investing approach that uh, a, a lot of people refer to as this cigar butt approach. And what that means is he would take the last puff out of the cigar. Like if it was a cigar that he found on the side of the street, he could take one free puff out of it before it was done. Um, and so what he's referring to there is he was going around and what he would do is he'd find companies that were trading below on the market. They were trading below the actual value of the assets. If you would liquidate the company, meaning you would sell off all the assets on the balance sheet of the company, those assets would actually be worth more than what it was trading for in the open market. So whenever he had this early on approach, he, and this he learned this from Benjamin Graham, he was he was reading all these Benjamin Graham books, and um, so he was implementing that approach where he'd go around and he'd try to find companies that were trading below the the net tangible asset value of the company. Uh, so he got in this position where he was buying up shares of Berkshire Hathaway. He was trying to buy a controlling share of Berkshire Hathaway because. It was one of these kind of companies. It was this dying business that um, was a textile business. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to get a controlling share and he was going to liquidate the company. He was going to kill, make, you know, basically send everybody home after he bought a controlling share. He would sell all the assets and he'd make money on the deal. So this was kind of hard for him. And because it was hard for him because as he was getting ready to liquidate this company and he was showing up, everyone viewed Warren Buffett as being the Grim Reaper. He was the guy that was coming to kill all of their jobs. And people obviously did not like that. And something that Warren Buffett did not like is he did not like the fact that 
people didn't like him. He found this to be a very awkward position and something that he never wanted to experience again. And so he kind of got himself in a position where he is in a little over his head with Berkshire Hathaway and the fact that he didn't want to be disliked. Uh, but at the same time, he was, how am I going to make money on this deal? Because he was heavily invested. I don't really remember how much of his portfolio consisted of owning this Berkshire stock, which was it making money at the time? Do you remember, Stig? Whenever he uh, was no, buying? not really. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't even think it was turning a profit uh, at the time that he was buying it. But remember, his intention of buying it at that time was to liquidate the company and make money that way, which is completely different than the way that we invest now and the way Buffett invests now. So he was basically buying up these shares of Berkshire Hathaway for a very long period of time, and then he was having to adjust his approach because he 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 made a promise to all the employees that I will not liquidate the company, I will not kill the company, basically make them rest assured as he was trying to acquire this controlling share. He stuck to his word that he was not going to liquidate the company. So what he found himself in in this unique position was that he started off with one intention, which was to kill the company, and it ended with, I'm going to save this company, and I'm going to figure out ways to you know make them profitable and, and turn everything around. And he did that. He actually did that, but it took him, he lost a decade or more of time because what he could have done is he could have just started his own company and then started nesting his picks inside of that, and he would have saved himself a whole lot of friction uh, in the process. But, you know, we could argue that the learning experience and his adjustment to his investing approach changed so dramatically from this experience that he might not be the person he is today if he didn't go through all that. So that's a little bit of the background on Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is a publicly traded company. It's just like Coca-Cola or Bank of America or whatever. It's it's a company just like that. And that's another thing that people don't realize. They, a lot of people think that Warren Buffett has like a hedge fund, but Berkshire Hathaway is not a hedge fund. It, it is a real company with real businesses uh, underneath of it. So uh, I wanted to give that background because if you didn't know that, I think it's very important for you to know that as we go through and we discuss the inner workings of this company that Buffett has been running since 1965. So as we poured through these shareholder letters, uh, we, we literally started with the year 1965, his very first shareholders letter, which hasn't really changed all that much. Uh, through the decades. I mean, I found it really amazing that he was already writing to his shareholders uh, in a manner that he's very conversational. He's 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 instructing, he's teaching ver- since the very beginning. Uh, and if you have not read these shareholder letters, these are like uh, the, the book of Genesis for investing. You know, <laughs> I think that anybody who has not read these and you're a hardcore investor, uh, you're really missing out because there's some amazing business advice in, in these uh, letters. So let's go ahead and talk about the four different businesses within Berkshire Hathaway. And Stig's going to go ahead and take that away. Yeah. So um, if you read the uh, the, uh, annual letters from Warren Buffett, he will be talking about that he actually looks at uh, Berkshire Hathaway as having four different companies or four different segments. And I think that's probably a very uh, good way of looking at Berkshire Hathaway because Berkshire Hathaway owns so many businesses. Um, I think that they probably own around 80 or something, like fully owned, and then they own like parts, so they own shares in you know multiple other companies. So you know, really to get an overview of how a Berkshire Hathaway looks today, I think the best way is to look at as as four different businesses within Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, the first business I like to talk about that's insurance. So uh, insurance was actually uh, a way that. Warren Buffett really early could get capital to uh, to invest in in other businesses, and we'll actually return in a later segment to talk about specifically how this how this work how this business model work. The second one is regulated capital intensive business. So that would uh, be, for instance, something like Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Um, it used to be called Mid American, uh, but it's that type of business. So in in the energy, for instance. And and Buffett owns isn't it like eighty percent of all the energy in the state of Nevada? Like he he his business owns all of the power that's basically being provided in Nevada. Is that right, Stig? Yeah, he has close to to monopoly in uh, in that huge region. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, yeah, and and another thing that's uh, that's also the uh, the railways. So you'll probably know this as uh, BNSF. And you know, so so these are somewhat new purchases from from Warren Buffett. I mean, it, it's this is not how we started because these businesses are very capital intensive. 
Uh, so, so that's just something worth mentioning. That if you hear about Warren Buffett talking about, it's really important not to buy into businesses that acquire a lot of capital. And then you're thinking, he's in energy, and he's in railways. You know, what what's happening here? This is basically Warren Buffett's uh, let's call it new approach of how to apply capital. Um, he's been saying it himself that it's not the most optimal way, but he actually is sitting on so much cash right now that this is still the best way for him to to buy into good businesses. And when and when and, Stig says that he's sitting on a lot of cash, uh, what's he sitting on right now? Sixty billion. Yeah, I think it's yeah sixty two. Yeah, <laughs> that, so, that's a lot of cash. Just a little bit. He, he's just sitting on a little bit of cash. Yeah, so so actually, I think it's rather relevant to speak about because the the second one that was regulated capital intensive business, and the third one that is uh, manufacturing, service, and retailing operations, and so this was actually some of Warren Buffett's uh, first buy. So that would be some you know everything from you know lollipops to uh, so that would be Seas Candy, for instance, to uh, to net jets. But a lot of these companies, especially in the beginning, you know, they were really really good returns on net tangible assets and those are really like the core of understanding how Warren Buffett invests you know these are really good businesses because they don't you know, take that much capital to make a decent profit and uh, again you might be thinking so why doesn't he do that why don't he buy you know new seas candy well there's just not enough out of the uh, you know there's not enough seas candy out there for for Warren Buffett to invest in well and i think you got to look at it this way too is uh, for him to invest in a company like Seize Candy, let's say that the company might have a market cap of fifty million, that's not even going to make a dent in his overall portfolio because it is so big. It'd be kind of like, uh, let's say you have a million dollars, your net worth is a million dollars, and somebody comes along and they want you to invest in a a company that has a market cap of three thousand dollars. That's that's not even going to move your needle at all. So why would I spend my time, which is his most valuable asset? Why would I spend my time? researching, digging into this, making sure that it's a good buy when it's not even going to make a dent in my portfolio movement. So he's really looking for those big hits. Like you saw him invest in Heinz in the past uh, couple of years, things like that, that are really going to move his needle. That's the things that he's really trying to pay close attention to. And then the, uh, the fourth business segment that is finance and financial products. So just to give you a brand, that might be something like Clayton Holmes, for instance. So that would be like rental and trailers and furniture and this sort of business. And it's actually the smallest one of the four. So, I mean, they, they are quite independent. They're quite, you know, for itself. But, um, you know, these are the, like the four business segments of Berkshire Hathaway. So now you might be sitting out there thinking, what about investments? Like, we know that he's a great stock picker, but where are all the investments? And that is actually... I would put that as a part of the insurance. In general, I would put that as a part of the insurance business. Uh, but we would definitely return to that. So what's I think the key takeaway here, and this is the thing that people really got to understand if you're really trying to be a, a business leader, is where in that list that Stig just named, the, the composition of this company, where did he mention textile business? And he didn't. <laughs> it's not there. Okay, so he bought a company back in 1965 that was a textile company, and now you you go 50 years into the future where we're at right now, and the company has had a total transformation, and that's the key here is change. If you're a leader, you have to adapt to change, or change will make you change, and uh, that's a more of a Jack Welch kind of quote, but. Um, it's so vitally important for people out there um, to stay competitive. You have to be adaptable. You have to move with the punches. You have to see what's coming and you have to be able to really adapt to that quickly. You got to be the first person. You got to be that person, but not assume a lot of risk at the same time. And that's hard to do. You've got to be a balanced person in order to conduct that, that change in that change environment. So uh, as we go through this, think about that and think about what Buffett has really done as a business leader, CEO, chairman of the board. He he led this organization. And I think that that's one of the key things that a lot of people don't look at. They only look at his stock picking ability when in all actuality, this guy is a business uh, magnet and tycoon that has led an organization to be you know a market cap over $300 billion. Yeah, and you know, I really would like to talk about Warren Buffett's leadership skills because that was something I really found profound when I, whenever I was reading the uh, the letters. Because 
Now he is so good at delegating and so good at motivating people. And so let me just give you like two short notes on that. Uh, the first one is that I found it really interesting that he keep uh, kept mentioning people by name whenever he's writing these letters. So he would be easily be name driving like 20 or 30 different people and saying, well, we should really be thankful to this manager because he has done an amazing job. So you actually have a lot of people. And, you know, this is not like, uh, I don't think he's manipulating or anything, but, you know, it's, it's really a, like a, a human thing that, we, you know, we all like praises. And Warren Buffett, he's really, really good at praising people. If they're doing a good job, I mean, that's, that's something he would always mention. So I think you can see when you're talking about his his leadership ability, what you really what you're seeing is how patient he is. Okay, whenever he's dealing with his subordinate leaders within his company, which he's got tons. I mean, just the operational subsidiaries. Not even talking like the non-operational ones, like uh, Bank of New York Mellon and Wells Fargo and all those. When you're talking about the ones that he owns a hundred percent of, he has like sixty different managers and 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 leaders, business leaders beneath him. He is insanely patient, like to the point that most people would not be able to do that. If somebody comes in and they have a bad year, there's often, my impression is that there's often very little said because people know what that expectation is. And so when do you see leaders that if somebody does something wrong, he doesn't really necessarily any say anything. They just know that they've done wrong and they know they better improve because if they don't, then maybe he'll do something about it later. But he's giving them that opportunity to fail. He's charging them with enormous responsibility. And when he does that and he kind of stays out of it, it's amazing that he's actually getting better results than that leader that's really trying to oversee and micromanage things. And it's just an amazing approach. And he's been so successful at it. Um, you set that precedence of how you should operate and you 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 watch and you monitor. And if people abuse it, well, then you do something about it. But if they have one bad downturn, maybe it wasn't their fault. Maybe it's something that they're, you know, just they had a rough patch and they're going to get back on their game. So uh, go ahead, Stig. Yeah. And I think that the best way to think about this is to think how many people does Warren Buffett have at his headquarters? Like he, he actually likes to joke about this. I can't remember the exact figure or something like 30 people or something like yeah, that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how can you like have the? I think uh, by market cap or is it by revenue is like the fourth biggest company in the listed company in the U.S. You know, I, I think that if you compare them to to the other uh, companies uh, around that, uh, you know, they will have hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the headquarters. Now he has like thirty people. Well, what he does at the end of each shareholder letter is he has a picture of his headquarters, and just to kind of give you an idea of the size. Uh, it's a single photograph and you can make out every single person's face in the photograph very easily. Then there's only three rows of people. So <laughs> they're probably, they're like 10 wide. So it's like this tiny little photo. You'd think it was like a little family reunion kind of thing. And that's his whole headquarters for his $300 billion company. So for the next uh, segment, I would like to talk about Berkshire Hathaway's special conglomerate structure. And I think, you know, whenever we talk about conglomerates, uh, you always have very different opinions on whether or not that's a good idea because can you, like, one of the most um, told argument is that can you keep focused when you have so many different things to keep track on? And, you know, in, in my opinion, I think that a conglomerate for a company like Berkshire Hathaway, that's really the, the main secret to their success. I mean, yes, of course, it's fantastic that Warren Buffett is good at picking stocks. I mean, no argument there. But I think that the structure where they can actually uh, invest where the money makes more sense, when you are as good as capital allocation as Warren Buffett, uh, that's really the secret to, uh, to his success. So what he does that's different than any other company whenever they buy a subordinate business is when you typically see that happen, the parent organization will come down and say, these are the new rules, the way that you're going to operate. All your letterhead is now going to have our business's name on it. Uh, and they basically take control of that business and they bring them into their architecture and to their um, standard operating procedures. Buffett has the exact opposite approach. He will buy a business and he'll look at the manager and he'll say, you know what? You guys obviously know what you're doing a lot better than I know what, what to do. So just keep doing exactly what it is that you're doing. That's the reason I bought you. And uh, you just report your numbers, show me your accounting at the end of the year. You know, you keep your brand name, you keep everything the way it is. 
and I'm just going to be standing over here. And in fact, if you make profits, you keep those profits down at your level at your level because you'll know how to employ those a lot better than I would know how to employ them. Um, and I think that that's just an amazing approach. That just no one does that. And you you find that these businesses that do start trying to take control of these these smaller businesses, they come in and they just mess it all up. I mean, it's not always the case, but it's usually the case. Uh, I know whenever there's a business that uh, is getting ready to buy a, a subordinate business, I always get very concerned with that. I get concerned that they're going to overextend themselves. They're going to take on too much debt. They don't understand even that line of business. And so by getting their hands in there, they basically throw all this drag into the equation and it creates you know a bad situation. Berkshire Hathaway takes the exact opposite approach. Yeah, and yeah, I think that the best way to really understand the true benefit of Berkshire Hathaway is to compare it to, let's call it a normal operating business. So, for instance, let's let's take a, a company like ExxonMobil. I mean, it could also be Apple or any other business. But if you look at a company like ExxonMobil, uh, whenever they make a profit, they have three different options of how to uh, uh, how to, how that would benefit the shareholders. And the first one that would be dividend. Okay, so they would pay out some of that profit to the shareholders. Now, um, as a shareholder, this is not a very efficient way of getting that because you have to pay taxes and you might just want to reinvest in that business. But basically, that's one way to do it. But so Hathaway doesn't do that because they're saying that instead of paying $1 out in dividend, they can create more than $1 in value. Now, the second thing that a company like ExxonMobil can do is that they can invest in the, in the existing business. But the problem is for a lot of listed companies that they're so big, so they can't keep investing in really you know, profitable projects. I mean, they would be first taking all the 20% a year projects, and then they would invest in all the 15% a year projects and 10% and so on. So a lot of the, the, uh, the projects that they can invest in, you know, they would not be good businesses. But so Hathaway would take that money that they may have profit and buy new businesses, or they might be, you know, widen the mode of some of the existing businesses. Now, for a lot of the really big companies uh, that are listed, they also repurchase the shares. Now, Warren Buffett, he's really, really good at this because he's very, very adamant about buying you know, shares in his own company when a really good price. But a lot of these big companies, they have these share repurchase programs where it will just be keep repurchasing shares you know, every day, every quarter, every year. And I guess, you know, to some extent, that's okay. At least it's tax efficient, but they are not, you know, buying the shares back at really good prices. And Warren Buffett is very, very clear on that. So I used to wonder, um, you know, years ago when I'd look at Berkshire Hathaway, I would get frustrated when he wouldn't be buying back shares at certain points in time. But the more that I've learned and the more that I've studied him, I think Buffett has an enormous respect for the power of liquidity. And I think that's one of the main reasons why he does not do uh, share buybacks like you see a lot of companies like IBM, for example, just go in bananas on their share repurchasing. Um, but I think Buffett has such a respect for the, the power that liquidity demands during stressful times and the deals that he can get that he actually values that more than maybe buying back his own equity whenever um, he could maybe Berkshire Hathaway is slightly undervalued compared to the rest of the market. Uh, something else that I wanted to highlight real quickly, uh, back to the previous conversation that we were having about him buying up all these different businesses and basically leaving them in place and not doing anything. The only way you can really do that successfully is if you're finding managers that are absolutely incredible. And that's one of his four tenets, one of his four rules that we talked about in, what was it, our second or third podcast that we did. Um, one of his rules is that he only invests in companies that have superior management. And so by doing that, by, by ensuring that he has somebody with a track record, years of experience that he trusts, um, that he knows is going to get results and that is always going to tell him the truth, he's putting him in a situation where he can actually employ those techniques. If you're buying a business and you don't really, and, and you're looking at the management like, ah, they're okay, that's probably not somebody you want to entrust with you know, just total control. And I think that that's a key point that we got to highlight if we're bringing that up. So uh, back over to Stig as he uh, kind of runs uh, the discussion here. So the uh, third segment I'd like to talk about is how float works. And if you don't know exactly what float is, let me just give you an introduction here. So uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they are an insurance company, or at least they have a very huge uh, insurance division. And 
uh, there be there, whenever they're writing premiums for say something like a hundred dollars, you know, the premiums that they're writing, you know, that is money that they are getting. I mean, that is liquidity, and of course they have to repay a lot of that, you know, in claims and they have a lot of expenses and so on. But that how that actually works if you just think about this in terms of like a hundred dollars. Berkshire Hathaway, because they are so good at writing insurance, they would keep some like two to three dollars on average uh, of that hundred dollars. So this has like two huge benefits. The first one is that hey, whenever they are you know having revenue of hundred dollars, they will have two to three dollars in profit. That's one thing. But the most important thing is actually in the meantime, they can actually hold on to that money and invest that. In you know businesses, stocks, and bonds, and they will give a hundred percent of the proceeds from that. So this one's huge. Uh, I mean, really, this is the bread and butter of Berkshire Hathaway, and this is the reason Buffett has been able to compound at such a high rate is because he's sitting on this enormous amount of money. And Geico's the engine here. Okay, he even says that in the shareholder letters. Geico is my engine of my vehicle, and. The reason why is because it's got all this float. He can reinvest that at the, you know, uh, as the market changes, he's adjusting the assets that are sitting on that float that are most optimal, uh, that are giving him the highest return. And then if there's an event that occurs that it requires a large amount of capital outlay based on the fact that some type of unprobable event happened, he's got the money sitting there. He can, he can transfer that to the people that would have claims. So that's big. And I don't think people really realize how robust his insurance business is. When you think Berkshire Hathaway, you should you should really be thinking insurance company because um, that's really the engine of the whole thing. Yeah, and you know, I know that we're just throwing a lot of numbers on you, and it might, it might be you know hard to uh, hard to get a grasp on. But he has eighty four billion dollars right now as a float, like he can invest in, and and just in comparison, he has one hundred seventeen billion dollars, you know, in in different stock investments. So. I mean, this is really, really something that, that's uh, important for Berkshire Hathaway. And, you know, where they really distinguish themselves from other insurance companies, because, you know, this is the business model for insurance companies in general, is simply that Warren Buffett has been really, really good at finding great investments. And he'd be really good at allocating that capital. So something I want to throw out there, because we talk about Monish Pabrai a lot. So Monish Pabrai is getting ready to start his own holding company. We've heard that the um, that that's going to happen this year. That he's uh, the company is going to be formed this year. And what's his engine? He's using an insurance company. He's taking the exact same model that Buffett did, uh, so he can invest that float and he can have larger returns. So it's going to be very interesting and and really fun to track Monish's uh, progress as he stands up his new uh, company. Oh yeah, I think that would be really, really interesting. And you know, just to just to also give people a peace of mind if if they think about insurance companies, it's not like insurance companies can just take that float and then invest a hundred percent of that in uh, in equities. So I mean, I also just want to make that clear. It's actually kind yeah. of more like banks, and they have like tier one and tier two capital, and a lot of that should be in fixed um, uh, fixed maturity assets, and so on. But yeah. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out uh, before we actually go into the fourth segment. So, Preston, I don't know what you thought when you read through all these letters. Uh, I know it's a long time ago for you, but when you realized that he was actually uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, they were using uh, derivatives. I was actually quite surprised when I read that in, in the beginning. So I think people will hear the word derivative and they immediately think, that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't understand maybe the context and way and, and how it was being used. So let's talk about futures and let's talk about derivatives uh, for people to maybe understand the, the advantages and disadvantages. So if I'm a farmer, okay, and I have a plot of land and I'm, uh, say I'm a wheat farmer and I can't be susceptible to major price swings in my crop whenever I sell it. For me, a futures market adds a whole lot of comfort and a lot of value because I can sell the wheat that I'm going to manufacture at a price that I know I'm going to get uh, if I entertain this idea of a futures market and selling things based off of a price that um, I know that I'm going to be able to get. So that adds a lot of value to certain markets. So when you think about like the airline industry, they're heavily reliant on oil prices. If oil prices are all over the place, 
uh, and they want to have some type of stability and, and be risk adverse to that fluctuation, they can buy their fuel on these futures markets in order to mitigate those risks. So for some people, it's a total risk mitigation strategy because they know what kind of price they're going to be dealing with and they know what prices they can offer their customers in advance because they've paid for that in, in advance. Where it gets really risky and where it gets the bad name is traders who are just basically manipulating the market have no interest in a product that they're actually or a service that they're actually providing to customers and that they're just basically manipulating these prices because they're taking wild risks by taking on leverage and investing in things that they're just basically making bets. That's where it gets bad. So whenever I look at Warren Buffett and he owns Coca-Cola, he owns a large portion of Coca-Cola, I think, what, 15% or something like that. So when you look at Coca-Cola, he's heavily reliant on sugar prices, uh, just as one example of one ingredient. Uh, There's many other things. Uh, You BNSF. He owns 100% of BNSF. I mean, that's a that's a railroad company heavily relying on fuel prices. Um, that stuff is very important. So for me, that makes total sense. But I think for somebody that would be, you know, you know his quote where he talks about how derivatives are weapons of mass destruction, financial weapons of mass destruction. He has that quote. And I think so people would see, they'd start reading his shareholder letters and they see that he's involved in this stuff. But in a way, he kind of has to be just because of the inherent nature of his business. Yeah. And um, let, let's just take an example, like if you were a stock investor and how that would work, uh, actually doing business with Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. So I might be managing, uh, say, a mutual fund, and I would really not like the market to drop. So what I would do is I would uh, buy a put option. So as a put option, I would uh, benefit from a drop in the market. And that might seem you know, a bit contradictory, but this is kind of an insurance for me. Because as a mutual fund, I you know make money with the market go up. So one way to secure that I have uh, somewhat of a stable profit would be for me to buy a put option. Now, so where could I do that? Well, I could do that using Berkshire Hathaway as my counterparty. So Warren Buffett would be selling put options. So basically, what that means is that if the market drops, then he would lose you know money, at least in theory. Now the um, the specifically puts that he had been selling, you know, they're really nicely structured because first of all, people would pay him money up front again. So it's actually kind of insurance, it's kind of insurance float. He can invest that money. And it's only if the market drops over, you know, 10 to 20 years that you have to pay some of that money back. And so he actually makes a few calculations of this and, you know, the market really, really has to drop for him to lose money. And then he's saying, even if he does that, he probably have a better return holding on to, to the premiums he had been getting for these options to begin with anyway. And this really important thing here is that Berkshire Hathaway has no counterparty risk. That, so, you know, usually, uh, at least for some of those derivatives, you know, if your counterparty went broke, uh, you know, you'd be sitting well the risk yourself. And that was some of the problems that happened in the, the crash in 2008. But since it is Berkshire Hathaway that is the insurer, they don't have any counterparty risk. So that's just something I, th- I found really interesting that he's always protecting his downside, even though it's in derivatives. Okay, so the next uh, category that we have listed here is how do you value Berkshire Hathaway? And I think this is probably one of the the funnest exercises that you can have because this is such a unique company and it has so many different variables. And I think it has a few hidden variables, which I'd also like to discuss. Um, so how would you do this? Uh, for us, we think that, you know, Stig and I, we think that the best approach is a discount cash flow model. Um, we look at how, how stable has the company been for Berkshire Hathaway. It's been extremely stable, very predictable in the, the movement that it's had. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's how it's going to perform into the future. But I think that we have a higher probability and expectation that it will perform that way into the future just because of its past record and, and past performance. But it it definitely does not guarantee it. And I think that's really important, whether you're investing in Berkshire Hathaway or any other company, that the future is unknown and you don't know what kind of events are going to occur. And you're always assuming uh, risk at an individual level when you invest in, in individual stock picks. So I want that to be very clear. But for me, whenever I would be valuing Berkshire Hathaway, I would look at his past uh, performance. How fast is he growing that cash flow? Um, and if it's somewhat predictable, then I would make some assessments as to what I think that would do into the future. Then I would uh, I would discount that back at an appropriate discount rate. 
So whenever we look at, and so that's the big question that a lot of people have when you're conducting the intrinsic value of a company, what discount rate do I use? And it's really up to the individual, like how much risk are you willing to assume? So whenever I look at the current market here in, in June of 2015, when I look at the S&P 500, based on how it's currently priced, I would estimate that the S&P 500 is going to give me about a 4% return. Whenever I looked at fixed income bonds, like a 10-year bond, um, they're at about, what, 2.5% in the, in the United States? So those are some pretty low returns, 4%, 2.5%. So when we're talking about a discount rate of how I'm figuring out the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway, I would say I think it'd be very good to first start off by comparing it to what the S&P 500's rate is. So if that rate is 4%, I think I'd probably start off with what will a 4% return give me on intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway? Because that way I'm comparing apples to apples. If the market is going to give me a 4% return, and then I figure out that Berkshire Hathaway is going to give me a 4% return at the current price, which we have calculators at buffettsbooks.com that helps you figure this out. We have a video at buffettsbooks.com that takes you step-by-step step on how to use the calculator. All of this is free. You don't have to pay anything. Just go to our website, buffettsbooks.com. You can use these calculators. But um, if I'm getting that same return with the S&P 500 at 4% and I'm getting the same return with Berkshire Hathaway at the current market price at 4%, which it's not, just so you guys know, I'm just using this as a comparison. If those two are giving me the same number, what would I invest in? Would I invest in the S&P 500 or would I invest in Berkshire Hathaway? For me, that's an easy decision. I don't even have to think about that. I'm investing in the S&P 500. And the reason I'm investing in the S&P 500 is because my risk is distributed across 500 companies, where with Berkshire Hathaway, it's only with one company. And I think some people might be really surprised to hear that. But the reason I say that is because it's based on the current price. If the price is the same as the S&P 500, I don't care how good Warren Buffett is, that selection of buying Berkshire Hathaway at a very high price, that's pricing it at a 4% annual return, doesn't make any sense to, to put risk into a company that could, an individual company that could fail. Now, I think if you would do the actual intrinsic value on Berkshire Hathaway right now, you'd probably get a much better return than what the market is offering uh, at 4%. So when that comes into play, let's say that we did it for Berkshire Hathaway right now and it was an 8% return. Okay, which is probably more realistic as to where it's at. Um, so you're getting double the return, but you're investing in an individual company. So there's more risk associated with that. That's where it becomes difficult for the individual person to make that decision. Which one do I go with? Because one has a little bit more risk because you're dealing with an individual pick. So that's kind of my thought process as I go through selecting uh, and valuing businesses is you gotta you first of all you gotta you gotta consider all the variables and there are a ton of variables at play here, uh, but I think that you always go back to that benchmark of what's the what's the S and P five hundred going to give me what's a fixed income bond going to give me which is impacted by inflation I will add okay so you got to consider that variable so those are just some of the thoughts and, and some of the things that I'm thinking about as I go through it I want to hear what Stig has to say though. Yeah, yeah, I I think it's uh it's really profound what you're saying, Preston, in how we are you know evaluating businesses because basically we are always discounting uh like the money we expect to to receive from that company. Um, but yeah, you know, I would like to talk about why you can probably not look at the income statement uh of Berkshire Hathaway and compare it to other companies because the structure is very very different because it's a holding company and they own a lot of different investments. So. What most investors do is that they will look at the bottom line and they would say like net income two billion. So then they might have this multiple saying, okay, I want to uh, purchase companies less than fifteen times earnings. Okay, so that company would be fifty times two, that would be thirty billion. Now I, I definitely see why you would do that, and for a lot of companies, uh, at least if you do it for like multiple years, it makes some kind of of sense just to give you an idea of of how profitable the business is. But you know, for a company like Berkshire Hathaway, I think that you should probably look elsewhere. Um, Warren Buffett, he talks a lot about look through earnings. I mean, that, that's one thing. And look through earnings is actually a, a very simple, simple concept. 
It's really because that they would own shares in, say, Coca-Cola. Now, because they don't own like a big share of Coca-Cola, uh, they only um, less than 20% of the company. What is happening is that they only recall the dividend that they receive from that company. So, say that Coca-Cola uh, would be making, I don't know how much money, but, but say that Berkshire Hathaway's part of that earnings would be $1 billion, then they might only be recalling $300 million because the rest is not in dividend. So I really like this idea of look-through earnings, and I think that it's a concept that very, very few people understand, and I think it's a concept that very few people actually discuss when they talk about Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Buffett, in his shareholder letters, really only talks about look-through earnings a few times uh, throughout the document, but when he does, it's very profound, and I think a lot of people could miss the boat on what he's talking about. So let me just kind of describe this from my own experience of, uh, so Stig and I both own our own companies. So inside of our company, we have different assets that we've created. So for example, one of our books, the Warren Buffett accounting book, that's one of our assets. So that brings in a certain amount of money every single month, but that is an asset that we have to report all of that income onto our income statement. So now is that one asset, let's just say that book is producing a flow of revenue and a flow of earnings. Some of that is retained within each of our companies. So what do we do with that money that's retained from that asset? Well, we invest in other assets. So we have the option to create, let's say we want to write another book. Okay. We could invest in that or we could invest in something that's non-operational, meaning I could invest in a share of General Electric. Okay, so that's an example. So if I invest in that share of General Electric all inside of my company Vale, okay, that would be another asset that would be added to my balance sheet, that one share of General Electric. Now, what's interesting is if I do that, General Electric, let's say that that one share of General Electric produces $3 of earnings. So do I list $3 of earnings on my company's income statement? No, I don't. I don't do that. But if General Electric pays me a dividend, I will list that revenue stream onto my income statement. Now, what people don't realize is that that dividend is only a, a small portion, typically around, I would guess, 33% uh, to 50% of what the company actually earned, that one share. Okay, so I'm only really reporting a portion of the earnings that that one share, that one asset actually made for the year. So what Buffett is saying in his shareholders letters, and this is really important, what he's saying is that, hey, I own $100 billion worth of non-operational stock, okay? The only thing that I'm reporting on my Berkshire Hathaway shareholder or on my Berkshire income statement is the dividends that I'm actually receiving from that $100 billion worth of stock. There is more earnings that are being produced from owning those companies, but I don't have to report that. That's being retained within those companies. But don't forget, that is real value. That is real earnings, even though I'm not reporting it. And so whenever the stocks grow, these, these stocks grow in value over time as he continues to hold them and continues to hold them, that's actually materializing into market value and increased market value over time. And that's what he's talking about whenever he says, look through earnings. If you want to study something out of the shareholder letters, one thing, I would argue that that's the one thing you need to study. Because if you're trying to value Berkshire Hathaway appropriately, I think you've got to include the value of look through earnings into your calculation. And I think very few people actually do that. So um, this is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing we've discussed in this entire uh, podcast episode is this idea of look through earnings. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, uh, Preston. And I also think that that's one of the reasons why so many people will have troubles um, evaluating Berkshire Hathaway because either they'll be looking at uh, net income or they would be looking at the comprehensive income. But the problem with the comprehensive income then is that it includes all the unrealized gains that they have acquired through that year. So, you know, if the stock market roars, you know, that would be reflected in the comprehensive income. Or, you know, if yeah. the opposite happens. It's really, really hard to evaluate a business that operates like that. And the key to do that, the solution to do that, is really to look beneath the earnings and say, what is the underlying 
value of this stream? How much has the underlying value of all these businesses really increased during that year? So I said that that was the solution, but it's really, really hard because they own so many businesses. Yeah. As a rule of thumb, my personal experience is, as I've done this calculation in the past, is that when you add in and you account for the look-through earnings, I think that you really do add about 20 to 30% more to the cash flow of the business. So if you're saying the cash flow is 100, I would say that the cash flow is actually like 120 or 130 uh, just because of this look-through earnings piece that people do not account for. And that's obviously a rule of thumb. <laughs> You'd want to actually do the calculation if you're uh, strongly considering putting in an, a, a large chunk of your portfolio in the Berkshire. So there's a lot of other things that we want to talk about. We actually had a very long list of different items here, but we're actually getting pretty long on the uh, on the podcast here. And I'm sure all this accounting talk is probably uh, boring some people. Other people might be eating it up. But uh, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about, but we don't have time to talk about, is this idea of intangible assets um, being protected from inflation. So if you have time to do a little research, uh, look that idea up, maybe type in uh, Warren Buffett, intangible assets, uh, inflation proof or something like that. And you can maybe read up some of that on your own. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to transition into the take a question from our audience. And this question comes from Dylan Richardson. Hi, guys. My name is Dylan and I'm a new listener to your show and love what you guys are doing. Earlier this year, I bought Ben Graham's Intelligent Investor book the one with Jason Zweig's commentary giving updates to some of his principles, and I've studied it as if it were a textbook. I'm in the process of rebalancing my stock portfolio in accordance to his defensive investor guidelines and have a question for you guys. I have most of my portfolio invested into individual stocks as well as an S&P 500 index fund. I'm reducing my individual stock concentration while trying to increase my exposure to international stocks. I'm looking at ETFs as the way to gain international exposure, specifically some of Vanguard's low-cost ETFs. My question to you is this. How would Ben Graham analyze an index fund or an ETF? He laid out very clear steps in Chapter 14 of his book for analyzing individual companies but nothing for analyzing larger groups of stocks, such as index funds. How can a Ben Graham defensive investor analyze an index fund? Thank you for taking time to listen and answer my question, and keep up the great work. Hey, Dylan, love this question, and it really pertains to uh, the discussion we were previously having in the episode where we were talking about the return that you got on the S&P 500. So I made the comment that I thought that the return would be 4%. So this is so simple and it's not anything that's really uh, takes a lot of effort uh, when I'm coming up with that figure. All I'm doing is I'm taking the, the overall P.E. ratio of the market. So for the S&P 500, you could take, um, you know, I like to use the Schiller P.E. Uh, so right now the Schiller P.E. is around like a 27. So all I'm doing is I'm taking one divided by 27. You're always going to take one divided by whatever the P.E. number is. And by doing that, you're basically flipping the P.E. ratio upside down and you're inverting it. So it's an E.P. ratio. Uh, When you do that, what you're doing is you're actually taking the earnings, the profit of the overall S&P 500, and you're dividing it by the price that everyone's willing to pay to own the S&P 500. When you do that, you come up with a percent. So one divided by 27 is giving you that rough number that I keep throwing around of 4%. So Graham, when you reference, I love the fact that you reference chapter 14 in uh, The Intelligent Investor because that's exactly where Graham passively talks about this idea. Um, Graham talks about that if you would take the earnings to price ratio, and he actually calls it that, uh, which is the same thing that I just quoted to you, taking one divided by the PE. He says that if you take the earnings to price ratio, you should be at least as high as the current high grade bond rate. And that was the exact discussion we were having earlier in the show. So Graham doesn't come out and say, hey, this is how you value an index because indexes during his time really weren't uh, anything like what it is now. But this is how ahead of his time that he actually was where he was already really talking about this concept. He was just kind of doing it passively. So that's how he values an index. There's really not too much more to it than that. Whenever you're evaluating an individual company, you've got a lot more risk to be concerned with because that risk isn't distributed across 500 different companies. 
So whenever I'm valuing an index, it's really just that simple. I'm just taking the PE ratio, I'm inverting it, and that's really the end of my analysis. I know that might sound really simple and simplistic, but that's really all it is. Yeah, and just one thing really quickly to, to say about Benjamin Graham um, is that I think that he would have a very uh, quantitative approach. I know that we're talking a lot about Warren Buffett and we're talking about how he evaluates companies, but his mentor and his old professor, Benjamin Graham, he was a lot more um, quantitative than, than Warren Buffett. So I actually think that, uh, first of all, Benjamin Graham would really like ETFs and, and indexes, and I think that he would really emphasize that you know, the cost was low and also that they had some very strict measures to be looking at. So he wouldn't like personal judgment in those funds. He would have like investing in companies that had the lowest book value or investing in the companies that had the lowest price to sales or you know, such metrics. Um, so if you find ETFs like that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, Benjamin Graham would like that. All right, Dylan, so awesome to have you part of our community. Um, we're going to send you a free signed copy of our book, The Warren Buffett Accounting Book. And uh, for anybody else out there, if you have a question like Dylan and you want to try to get it played on the show, uh, go ahead and go to asktheinvestors.com. You can record your question there. And if uh, we really like it and we think that it fits with the episode, uh, we will definitely play that and uh, try to give you a good response. So uh, everybody out there, thank you so much for everything that you do. You're helping us out tremendously by going to iTunes, leaving reviews, uh, sending us emails, and we just appreciate it so much. It's just so much fun to interact with our audience. So uh, we really appreciate that. We hope that you guys really got a lot of value out of this discussion of Berkshire Hathaway's shareholder letters, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 